It's a great honor for me to be here to uh, present one of the lectures here at the Kristen Moore Annual uh, Lecture Series. Uh, I've always been a great admirer of Chris and her work, as well as all of her many colleagues uh, at uh, Child Trends. The organization, as all of you know, serves just as an invaluable source of information on what's happening to children nationally, as well as in many jurisdictions. And in fact, I had the benefit of sitting on another board where Carol presented uh, uh, another a set of studies on, on uh, just how children are being impacted in the District of Columbia. And in fact, I started a series of, uh, of studies at the Urban Institute called Kids Share. And the truth be told, I haven't said this publicly, but although it's obvious, the name itself was trying to play a little bit on the child trends. Child trends, kids share. They'd, they'd actually draw a connection and view it as somewhat of a supplement to all the great data put out by child trends. Uh, as you know, this lecture also was created by Child Trends, not only in honor of Chris, but also to try to uh, speak about issues related to children's well-being, uh, encourage a thoughtful public discussion of those issues. And I can think of no issue today uh, that's more at the center of, of our debate, in fact, our presidential and congressional and uh, state-level uh, election debates uh, than what's going on with, with the budget. But as you know, the headlines that surround uh, this type of debate are often very misleading. Uh, certainly campaigns are not known for uh, uh, precise truth-telling. In fact, I'm reminded of some of the confusing and uninformative headlines from the past in other areas. For example, you might have heard the one, something went wrong in jet crash, experts say. <laughs> or Reagan wins on the budget, but more lies ahead. Juvenile court tries shooting defendants. <laughs> Teacher strikes, here's a good one for Chicago. Teacher strikes idle kids. <laughs> and then one of my favorite, two convicts escape noose, jury hung. <laughs> so what I want to discuss today is the broad intersection of public policy towards children with the inevitable actions that are going to take place to deal with our current budget imbalances. Now in many other lectures, I stress the extraordinary complications involved in, in, in the large size of these deficits and just why we might have to deal with them. I think Mindy's already covered that a bit. And today I'm going to turn a tail a little bit and try to speak a little more to what I think of as the optimistic side of, of this issue. You see, America and Americans are at their core an optimistic and can-do people in society. We've had crises far worse than the current one and have come through with a strong belief in ourselves and our ability to make a better world for ourselves and our children. In a book I'm now writing with Hilary Haas, which we consider in many ways a manifesto uh, for our youth and for children in the future, uh, we start by citing one of John F. Kennedy's speeches. But why some say the moon? He was speaking about uh, the attempt to try to land a man on the moon. Why choose this as our goal? And they may also ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? And with a nod to traditional American comp confidence and optimism to our historic quest to scale mountains and explore the unknown, Kennedy answered in his own way. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because the goal will serve to organize and, best, and measure the best of our energies and skills because the challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we are not willing to postpone, and one that we will win. I think that today the children's community is united on a similar quest. We intend to win this challenge, and we will. Now, many years ago, I started writing and talking about what I called the incredible shrinking budget for children and working families. I projected then what we see now, a decline in real spending on children, and a significant decline in their share of the federal budget, not to mention state budgets. That's the bad news. But now consider the inverse. If children are scheduled to be the big losers under today's budgetary rules, an unsustainable set of budgetary rules, then the flip side is that they're likely to be the biggest winners, the biggest long-term winners from any real budget reform. I emphasize the words long-term. You won't see gains right away when there's a huge discrepancy between the promises made for extraordinarily high benefits and extraordinarily low taxes uh, that will cover those benefits. You will see it once space, fiscal space sometimes it's called, is created in the budget for many of the new and different things that greater fiscal freedom makes possible. 
So let's begin with the squeeze now on children's programs. Right now, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, defense and interest, excluding any spending on children, uh, our loan is scheduled to absorb all of government revenues, even revenues that would rise. From another perspective, in 2009, for the first time in all of American history, every dollar of spending had been mandated or committed, sometimes called uh, entitled, before Congress even walked in the door. Every dollar of appropriations, and that's where most children's spending lies, had to be paid for out of borrowing and the deficit. But does this mean that we are living in an age of austerity? That's what some conclude. Does it mean that we are a poor country that can't afford to care for its children, that can't uh, take on new uh, issues and new uh, responsibilities, and that we can't stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and rise even further? I think it's hardly true. As Joe Theismann once said about football, you don't need to be a genius to figure this out. A genius is someone like Norman Einstein. The crazy aspect of this whole budget problem is that it's all self-imposed. If we were a well-educated family that decided to buy some McMansions and work less at the same time, we might complain that we couldn't afford our food bills. But that's turning the situation upside down. I have a dream sometimes that I'm sitting in the Ways and Means Committee room, and someone from the National Institutes of Health comes in and shouts, Eureka, we found a cure, though expensive, for cancer. And people in the audience sit back and they're happy. They think of the great gains there will be for themselves and for their families and for their neighbors. And then I look behind the dais and the podium and I look at the members of Congress and they're sweating and commiserating among themselves and I ask myself, what's going on? And then I figure it out. People live longer and there's more health expenses than the Medicare budget's even further out of balance. Social Security's further out of balance. They can't raise taxes to pay for it. The whole situation's gonna be worse. That's how upside down this whole budget uh, situation is. You see, almost every aspect of our current budget crisis is caused by good things happening to us. In particular, there would be no long-term budget issue. There would be significant surpluses in the future we could decide either how to spend or even allocate in the way of tax cuts if we had just adjusted for people living longer and we hadn't allowed health costs or health care to get better. But health care did get better. We are living longer. Those are good things that are happening to us. We just have a budget that doesn't know how to respond uh, to those types of things. Now, admittedly, there's also an issue because of lower birth rates, but even that involves both less uh, responsibilities for families to do child care and a bit more to, pay for, uh, to take care of older people. As I say, our budgetary reaction, however, is not to try to work a little longer or to pay a little more tax to try to cover these good things that we want, this better health care, these longer lives, and, and the cost of living longer lives. Uh, instead, it's been just the opposite. We've decided we'll work shorter lives and we'll lower our taxes uh, and we'll provide more retirement years and benefits uh, and we'll expand health care in a way that actually many of the expenses and many of the costs go to the providers and don't even go to the consumers. The point is this long-term budget crisis is not due to some outside force. It's not due to some disease or some attack. It's due to our political response to, uh, to good things happening to us. Yes, there was a great recession, but despite the crisis it also caused, it's not the driving force between the long run and balances. They are due to nothing more or less than poor budgeting for the evolving economy in which we live. Again, in my work with Larry Haas, we show how the deficit is a mere symptom of a broader disease, and that's one of my fears in the current budget negotiations. Attacking the deficit is insufficient. We have to go after the disease, and the disease, simply put, is the attempt of both political parties to try to control the future, control the future before it comes. It's like a business that would decide it's projected its revenues are going to double in the next 30 years, and therefore it decided it was signed all these contracts for all the plants and equipment they would buy 30 and 40 and 50 years from now. Democrats build unaffordable growth in a variety of health and uh, retirement programs that generally exclude children, and Republicans decide they'll respond by refusing to pay our bills, even in good times, sending these bills and the interest on those bills as well to our children. But back to the opportunity side of this ledger. I've done a very simple calculation of total federal, state, and local spending uh, for including tax subsidies uh, as a society. Does anyone who want to take a guess what it adds up to per household? Take total spending, add in the tax subsidies, divide by number of households. Anybody want to take a guess? It's $50,000. We're spending, government is spending, counting the tax subsidies, $50,000 a household right now. This is not a government that's poor and cannot afford anything. We may have a bad budget that deals with this. We may allocate the money badly, but it's, we, are not, we are not poor. 
And moreover, that $50,000 is more than the average income, the average income of households in the 1960s. And if you want to look at the social welfare budget, which is about $30,000 a household, that's grown by about three quarters since the time Ronald Reagan, in real terms, since the time Ronald Reagan's been elected president. What's the cause of all this? Well, it's economic growth. Project forward into the future. President Obama's last budget suggested that within 10 years, the federal government would be spending about a trillion dollars more, a trillion dollars more in real dollars than it's spending today. But of course, where does all the money go? Well, about 800 billion of it goes towards Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, excluding children. And another 400 billion, three or 400 billion goes to interest on the debt. There's a chart in, in, in your package if you want to look at it. You'll see that we've already spent more than the trillion dollars uh, on those programs. And so every other program essentially goes into decline or basically stabilizes and doesn't get any growth in real terms, declines substantially uh, in, in relative terms. And what drives these projections? Well, it's really nothing more. If you look closely at the Congressional Budget Office numbers that Mindy and others cite, it's nothing more than economic growth. The Congressional Budget Office projects in 10 years will be about 30 percent richer as a society. Revenues will grow not only by that 30 percent, but actually even at a current law, even without, uh, uh, ex even without uh, rescinding the Bush tax cuts or other, other types of things, uh, we, we, revenues will grow by 30 to 50 percent. So the numbers don't uh, change that much whether Republicans or Democrats actually win. Republicans win, it'll be less. Democrats win, it'll be a little more. But there is more money because if we restore economic growth, we get the revenues that come with it. And there's room to do more for children if we just grab a hold of the budget and start controlling this growth instead of leaving growth, leaving decisions to the future rather than trying to uh, fight this battle of ever more money for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid excluding children, and ever lower taxes uh, to not pay for it. Uh, I even go further. You know, historically, if you look at the last century, our incomes grew eightfold on average over a century. Uh, they typically have doubled in 30 or 40 years. What we need to be thinking about if we're really into children's agenda is how to move beyond these few years of deficit reduction and how we want to start capturing an ideal for where we want that growth to go. What type of society do we want for the future? There's plenty of room in there uh, for, uh, uh, for, for our children. And nothing, I believe, captures the, stands the chance of capturing the public's vision and its motivation for that future than figuring out how we can make better lives for our children and our grandchildren, how we can invest in them, their future, and their opportunities. Listen even closely to the candidates in almost every election. They all speak of the American ideal of opportunity, and nothing again better fits with that opportunity agenda than the right types of investment in kids. In this new budgetary world that eventually can and should come out of the current wrenching debates, I also see a substantial emphasis on measuring what works and making resource allocations on that basis. Now, performance measurement isn't new. We've heard it before. We've heard of planning, programming, and budgeting, of government performance review, of zero-based budgeting, and, of course, the base cost-benefit analysis. A performance measurement is really nothing more than uh, a further takeoff on that. But I do think that in the 21st century, there will be far more emphasis on this uh, for a variety of reasons. Implicitly or explicitly, Democrats as well as Republicans recognize that growth in government in the 21st century will be very different than the 20th. I do some simple calculations. In the 20th century, government as a share of the economy grew sixfold. It grew, if you count state and local government, from about 5% of the economy to about 30%. It's not going to grow another sixfold this century. It's not going to grow from 30% to 180%. We economists are not very good at projections, but I can make that <laughs> one for you. But the other growth in, the, in, the, in government budget, again, comes from economic growth. Economic growth will be the source of, of revenues and spending for the future, the main source, and that's what we need to capture. But without being able to simply add on new government programs, without worrying about whether government grows from 30 to 35 percent or 25 percent, the current great fight we have, uh, that's a small potato as compared to how we, how we deal with this growth made possible by the economy as a whole. But in this new world, there's going to be much more emphasis on reallocating. It's not just going to be adding. Government's not going to grow from 30 to 50 or 180 percent. We've got to sort of reallocate that, uh, that 30 percent. And in this new world, I think no group better exemplifies this new approach and is better able to take advantage of it than the children's community. And that's in part because uh, uh, we start 
not to our, our advantage. We start in some ways with an inferior budget status, but we've led because of, we've been led according to that to put a lot of effort into the studies as to what works and what doesn't work. We also have the advantage, I think, that we're a community, for the most part, that's not advocating for ourselves, and that gives us a little more credibility than those who lobby only, only, only for themselves. And then as a just a very practical matter, dr dr driving through all of their research, it just turns out if you invest early enough in anything, you often get returns that compound over the longest period of time. So if we're going to invest in people, what better than to invest in the young and in children at early ages? So in a sense then, well-designed children's programs stand poised for a new era of fiscal policy making, even though one must begin with budget reform that often focuses too much on the deficit and too little on the underlying disease. A final warning, advocates for children's programs should not try to prove that everything they do provides extraordinary returns to society. Many government programs already provide negative returns, but are not subject to this type of performance review. We don't want to be in a situation where children's programs have to prove they provide extraordinary returns and other programs aren't subject to performance review at all. Uh, as indicated uh, uh, by Chris in her comments, I think there is much common ground upon which future budgets could proceed. Such common ground includes many of the items I've discussed here. The importance of investing, particularly in children, the value of supporting evidence-based programs, agreement on many of the programs that must be reformed, and a common base of facts upon which we can stand and move, including just what possibilities stand before of us if we just again regain control of the resources made possible by economic growth. My wife once said I was a short-run optimist and a long-run, I'm sorry, a short-run pessimist and a long-run optimist, and I think in some ways that defines how I feel about the current budget situation. You know, in general, uh, there is a notion about a pessimist. A pessimist is someone when he looks, when he smells the scent of flowers, looks around for a casket. I think we have strong reason to be optimistic about the future of children's programs. It's long term, it's going to be a significant fight. I think as Kennedy once said, we can win this fight and we will and we must. Thank you.